We don't understand the pathology of the rich. Um, we've been saturated with uh, cultural uh, images and uh, a kind of cultural deification of wealth and those who have wealth. We, we are being, uh, you know, they present people of immense wealth as somehow leaders, oracles even. And um, uh, we don't grasp internally uh, what it is an oligarchic class is finally about or how venal and morally bankrupt they are. Uh, we need to recover the language of class warfare to grasp what is happening to us. And we need to shatter this self-delusion that somehow if, as Obama says, we work hard enough and study hard enough, we can be one of them. Uh, the fact is the people who created the economic mess that we're in were the best educated people in the country, Larry Summers, former president of Harvard, and others. Uh, the issue is not education, the issue is greed. And I, unfortunately, had the experience of being shipped off to a private boarding school at the age of 10 as a scholarship student and lived, I was one of 16 kids on scholarship, and I lived among the super rich, and I watched them. Uh, and I think much of my uh, hatred of authority and my repugnance for the ruling elite comes from having been among them for so long. Yeah, people don't understand the elite schools, uh, even at the high school level, right. that, that they get, the kids get excellent educations, that, but it, they learn the whole culture of hundreds or thousands of years of how to rule. Right. And, and it's it, a deep, rich understanding of it. Not only that, but they, you know, the, and George Bush is a perfect example of that. Well, not so much a, an example of deep, rich understanding. No, but, but of, of how, you know, affirmative action for the rich. Uh, and I came, certainly on my mother's side of the family, from, you know, lower working class. I mean, people, my, one of my uncles lived in a trailer in Maine, and certainly people with no means. And I would juxtapose the world I was in with that world. And uh, it was very clear that it wasn't about intelligence or aptitude. Uh, the fact is, if you're poor, you only get one chance. Uh, if you're wealthy, like Bush, you get chance after chance after chance after chance. So you're a C student at Andover, and you go to Yale, and you go to Harvard Business School, and you're AWOL from uh, your National Guard unit, and you're a cokehead, and it doesn't really matter. You don't even really have a job till you're 40, and you become president of the United States. So um, that was what was particularly insidious, how those small, tight, elite, oligarchic circles perpetuated themselves and promoted mediocrity, because many of these people, like Bush, are very mediocre human beings, uh, at the expense of the rest of us, and how with money uh, they game the system. And of course now we live in an oligarchic state where we've been rendered utterly powerless. Uh, and our, the judiciary, the legislative, the executive branches all subservient to an oligarchic corporate elite. Um, and the press is owned by an oligarchic corporate elite, which makes sure that any critique of them uh, is never broadcast over the airwaves. And it's, not, it's not some like inherent evilness or something, but you are you are brought up as a super rich, or very rich, in a culture, in a school, in a milieu where everyone's there to serve you. It's right. your right to be served. Uh, yeah, it's 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 very distasteful to see because, you know, I would go to the homes of friends of mine and watch, and let's remember their children, 11, 12 years old, ordering around adults, their servants, their nannies. Uh, and, I, and I begin that piece by talking about Fitzgerald, who uh, came from the Midwest to Princeton and went through much the experience that I went through. Uh, and uh, that apocryphal exchange, which didn't take place, but, but it does represent the difference between Hemingway and Fitzgerald, where uh, Fitzgerald at one point had written, but the story is that he said, the rich aren't like you and I. And Hemingway is supposed to have quipped, yes, they have more money. Well, Hemingway, uh, like on many things, was wrong. Uh, the rich are different, uh, because when you have that much money, then human beings become disposable. Even friends and family become disposable and are replaced. And when the rich take absolute power, then the citizens become disposable. 
which is in essence what's happened. Um, there, there is a very callous indifference. I mean, these people, and C. Wright Mills wrote about this in the power elite, they're utterly cut off. I mean, the only people they ever meet who are members of the working class are people who work for them. They're gardeners or they're chauffeurs. Um, they, they live in self-encased bubbles. They have no real contact with reality. I mean, they don't even fly on commercial airlines. Uh, and yet they have absolute power. Now, that becomes very dangerous politically uh, because they're so out of touch. Uh, and they are able to retreat into their enclaves in the same way that you saw in France under Louis XVI, people retreating into Versailles or the end of the Chinese dynasty when yeah. everybody went to the he's, Forbidden he's City. He's that Ray Deluge, is he? Not? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, I think, you know, so that they will extract more and more and more uh, because they know, have no self-imposed limits without understanding the economic, political, and social consequences of what they're doing. So. We have a popular uprising through the Occupy movement where people pour into public spaces to uh, express legitimate grievances. Student debt, the next bubble to go down, a trillion dollars in debt, which we now saw courtesy of our Congress, uh, debt rates will, you know, interest rates will actually go up in a couple of years. I mean, more than if they'd just taken it from a bank, it's insane. And meanwhile, the Federal Reserve is uh, buying $85 billion a month worth of junk bonds and giving money at virtually 0% interest to Goldman Sachs. I mean, it's insane. The failure to address the mortgage and foreclosure crisis, the failure to address the chronic unemployment, underemployment, which, I mean, half of the country now lives in poverty, including the working poor uh, or near poverty. And what is the response? The response is to physically shut down the encampments, uh, uh, suspend uh, unemployment benefits, cut food stamps, uh, close things like Head Start. It's crazy. Um, and, and that's what happens when you have an elite that is that unplugged, which our elite is. Um, so they will push and push and push myopically um, out of ignorance until something erupts. And that's exactly where we're headed. It's interesting. There are some children of some of the super rich, and I think Occupy had something to do with it who kind of uh, woken up a bit to the situation and, and don't want to repeat the pattern of their parents, get some of the, get some of the uh, insanity of it. I don't know if they're, if, they're, if they're children of the super rich. I think that Occupy had a lot of children of the middle class. No, no, I don't mean the majority of Occupy. Oh. But I, just, I actually know who some of these people oh. are. Well. And it's interesting. that They're children of very, very wealthy people, and they have decided that you know, there needs to be more to life than repeating this, living in this bubble. Well, they may be out there, but I don't think they're a majority. They're uh, a very uh, tiny minority. Most of them get sucked right into that cult of the self, which the super-rich uh, manage to uh, perpetuate at a rather nauseating level. Uh, we were talking off camera just before we started how we both knew Gore Vidal. And Vidal used to go on about the total amorality of the super rich. Uh, he would know. <laughs> well, he would know for a lot of reasons. Uh, right. One, in terms of his own life, but also in terms of he, he knew many of these people. Well, so did I. I mean, and, and, and I think that's what I'm getting at. Exactly. I mean, you, you know, I, I wrote in that column about, you know, being at this boarding school and watching these fathers pull up in their limousines, fathers who had very little contact with their sons, with their personal photographers. And these were famous, wealthy men. And that picture of them playing with their son, which was a total a fiction, would be uh, disseminated through the press. Um, yeah, amorality, hedonism, selfishness, um, callousness. Mm -hmm. And, and part of it is the, uh, the total willingness to accept, for example, that ordinary people's families should send their kids off to war right. to defend the American way of life, which means essentially their way of life, right. can die for these things. Um, it's, it's, it's almost a, a kind of racism. I mean, when the British enslave the Irish, you don't have to be black and of color to be thought of as less than human. And, and that seems to be what the super rich think about most, most other people. Well, not, and not just the working class. I mean, the kind of disdain for the working class and also the middle class. I mean, in some way, the way they would speak about the middle class um, and, you know, in essence, coming out of the middle class, this was something that, that struck home to me. Um, uh, yeah, they live, they inhabit another world and they have a very sophisticated mechanisms of public relations and well-publicized acts of philanthropy to hide uh, 
their private faces, but how they act when the doors close and how they act in public is very different. And having, as Vidal was, as Fitzgerald was, you know, having been behind those closed doors and seeing the decadence of the ruling elite, um, it, it cert certainly marked me for the rest of my life. And it, 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 it defined for me at a very early age who my enemies were.